Thank you, Patricia. It was beautifully presented, and I must note as the moderator, perfectly on time. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, so next, we will uh, welcome Julian Smith, uh, an architect and the executive director of Willow Bank, uh, a wonderful school and organization in Canada, uh, and as his bio notes, uh, one of the co-authors of the HUL recommendations. So Julian, please. I was glad to see the Rutgers motto is um, Jersey Roots uh, Global Reach. I was born a few miles from here to Canadian parents. We then moved to India, uh, where I grew up, and in Canada, so I feel right at home. I also want to thank Archer Sinclair Harvey for the invitation to come here, and I want to particularly thank Ken Taylor, um, who's, uh, I wouldn't be here except for his intervention, so thank you, Ken, very much. I would also like to start by saying that I think my view of the whole recommendation is a bit different from Patricia's. I, I think um, what you've just seen is, to some extent, the urban, the historic urban landscape is a very complex artifact, uh, and the question is, how do we take care of that? And, and that, to go back to Gustavo's point, is sort of the curatorial management of what is, in fact, an extremely complex and fascinating artifact. I think that's what the Vienna Mem Memorandum was about. I think Hull was trying to move that idea into a new paradigm. I think it got part way there, and that's what really fascinates me is this new paradigm. And before I start, I just want to say that, in general, the way I explain it to my students is that the the historic preservation movement in the 20th century defined itself in a modernist context, and in a sense, it was anti-modern, but it, in order to be anti-modern, it had to adopt the assumptions of modernism in order to operate. I think one of the things that's happening is we've moved into a post-modernist phase, and we're not sure how to react because we don't know what an anti-post-modernist position is. <laughs> and in fact, we're probably post-modernist the anti-modernists have become post-modernists, so that means we're right in the middle of it, we're not opposed to it. And so that actually creates a lot of angst for people who enjoy being part of a counterculture. <laughs> and I want to refer to something that Gustavo mentioned, and this is this idea that there are various biases that bring people into the field, and I think they're very important. I see them as kind of layers, all of which exist. Uh, so that thing along the top, I think in the 18th century we saw the birth of this kind of antiquarian bias taking on uh, an actually uh, an organized uh, presence, particularly through the archaeological surveys of Mexico and Iraq and Egypt and India and Ceylon and so on. Um, I just want to run through these. So in the antiquarian bias, I think the archaeologist is preeminent in that sites are interesting as ruins. And in fact, the Scheduled Monuments Act, you could only get on it one of the first pieces of heritage legislation if you were empty and abandoned. But the original material, and this is from the Archaeological Survey of India, fascinated the archaeologists because from that material they could weave a whole story, often of cultural landscapes that had vanished. And I find that archaeologists are in fact very in tune with the idea of, of cultural landscapes because it's part of their, I think, anthropological training. Uh, Stuart and Revit, at the, in this 1788, when they published the Antiquities of Athens, recorded the archaeological remains. They then used beautiful copper plate etchings to reconstruct what the Parthenon might have looked like. But as archaeologists, you're interested in the ruin, because that's the genuine, or in UNESCO terms, that has the authenticity and the integrity. Then we get a commemorative bias, which I think is a very different reason to be involved. And the historian becomes really preeminent. And I date it to the Ladies' Auxiliary of Mount Vernon. And the idea of a site being important because of its historical associations. And this is the, then this historical reason for a site. But as with the antiquarian bias, this is still the object as something which is identifiable, separable. And this is Mount Vernon today. Uh, Fort Anne, our very first national historic site in Canada, um, as it was originally found and, and the citizens of that community uh, asked the federal government to set it aside. Essentially an archaeological site. Currently, it's a commemorative site. It, the siding actually now is a cement board, so it'll last better. It looks sort of like what it did. That's the same building as the one in the background there, which was a timber frame building, which has simply been reproduced. Because unlike the archaeologists, it doesn't, the fact that the building isn't original, it's a reconstruction, still allows the commemorative value of that site to be there, which is really a stage set on which one can reenact some of the stories of history. 
The aesthetic bias, which I see as very dominant now in the field, and in fact runs through the Vienna Memorandum and certainly well into the historic urban landscape recommendation, is where the architect and the architectural historian become preeminent in the field. I see Colonial Williamsburg as having been very influential in this because it was developed as a commemorative site, but it became so powerful as a kind of an aesthetic which people appreciated. And because it emerged at a time of increasing modernism and a, a dislike of both modern architecture and planning, there began to be this sort of uh, counterbalance. The very first historic district in Canada was uh, Gastown in Vancouver. This is a before photo that cafe on the right, Fish and Chips. The place was actually extremely popular and a, a kind of landmark in the community. But this is the after. That's an aesthetic interest in conservation. That becomes a historic district where the Victorian facade is beautifully revealed, the paint color schemes. The brick paving is, in fact, probably from Williamsburg, <laughs> put into the Canadian context because everybody loved that, and cast iron street lamps and so on became part of the vocabulary. So this idea of the aesthetic importance, and this was a Heritage Canada poster from the 1980s, which I think pretty well represents the aesthetic bias. Huge numbers of people in North America joined the historic preservation field because of this bias. It became a very strong bias. And this is this district we just saw, the very first historic district in the US, and these are the design guidelines. If you follow every one of these 14 design guidelines, what you're saying is, all right, I accept the aesthetic, and I will live with it. So now we get to what I see in our students at Willowbank, a whole new generation who have heard the word ecology since they were in kindergarten, and for whom an ecological approach to the world is absolutely essential because the planet is not going to survive if we don't have an ecological approach. It's also true in this uh, sense that the indigenous communities around the world have become absolutely central in defining what an ecological approach is. And so their voice, certainly in Canada, has become extremely important. An ecological approach to me is a postmodernist approach. And I see the Hull recommendation as moving towards an ecological approach, which in fact undermines many of the patterns we have. And to go back to Randy's comment, one of the things is I don't think you can register cultural landscapes and put them on the National Register because they don't have boundaries. They exist in the imagination. A cultural landscape is a place that exists in the cultural imagination. A historic landscape is something quite else. Certain aspects about the ecological approach, the historic and the contemporary combined. This was a site in Hungary 35 years ago, which created quite a stir in Canada because it was a historic place. There were drawings of it, but then it was reimagined using contemporary materials. So this idea that you could add a contemporary layer into a historic setting and have something that was richer than either one by themselves was very dramatic at the time. The connection between architecture and landscape, and I've often said to people the 20th century was a century of architecture. The 21st century, I think, is going to be a century of landscape. But that connection here in an Aboriginal elementary school in British Columbia. Then the World Heritage Committee adopting this idea of cultural landscapes. The Lake District was significant not just because culture and nature came together, and that's obviously fundamental to the idea, although for many indigenous communities that's never been a separation. So the sort of excitement about that really comes out of a Eurocentric view that this is quite an achievement to connect culture and nature. Interestingly enough, the national parks, the natural parks in Canada, the new director general appointed just a few months ago is Aboriginal, and that to me is a hugely significant appointment because suddenly the natural parks will be understood as cultural landscapes. But what was also important about the Lake District is that it has to be interpreted in a way through poets and artists and writers. And that's part of, I think, what reinforces the idea that cultural landscapes exist in the imagination. And because of that, you can't observe a cultural landscape. You can only experience it. And you can only map it through experience. And certainly, this, uh, we had the Spirit Sings exhibit 25 years ago in Canada, uh, putting native artifacts for the first time in an art gallery, putting beautiful lights on them, glass cages around them. And the Lubicon protested at the opening, and the gallery director said, oh my goodness, what are you? Finally, your art is being treated as high art. And they said, what you don't understand is that a mask is not a cultural object until it's being danced. And because you put it in a glass case, it's just it's just displaying ignorance. It should be set aside and put in a dark place when it's not being danced. When it is being danced, it becomes a cultural reality. 
And so that sense of cultural practice as being essential to cultural landscape is important. And I think the NARA document was mentioned in ISA where the ritual rebuilding every 20 years creates this idea that ritual and artifact in the cultural landscape model are completely interconnected. Lisa Prosper, who's Aboriginal and has just become director of our Center for Cultural Landscape at Willowbank, um, has written beautifully. I think she's our most, in Canada, our most important sort of voice in articulating an understanding of cultural landscape. She's written under these five headings. I won't go through them, but it's just this interrelationship of artifact and ritual, I think, is, is critical to this uh, question. So I've done these diagrams. This, to me, is a natural site on the left and a cultural site on the right existing within the grid of modernism. And this is where I say this, these things come into existence within a modernist system. Then we get very good at it in the historic preservation movement, and we adopt the modernist principles, and we figure out how to draw our own lines around them, how to educate our own people, how to give MAs and PhDs in heritage conservation, how to become part of the silos of modernism, how to draw legal boundaries, how to become part of the grid. And as the Aboriginal community will say, if you take an Aboriginal archaeological site, the archaeologists arrive, the first thing they do is put the grid on it. Once more, it's become a European site, a colonial site rather than an Aboriginal site. The grid is essential to modernism. The classifying of objects of knowledge, the university and the museum are stereotypical modernist institutions. So this is one idea of a cultural landscape. You take these two things in the middle and you say, let's create a new typology. We'll call it a cultural landscape. It's nature and culture together. So the environmentalists and the historic preservationists can get together. Uh, I don't see this at all. I think this is a form of historic landscapes. Certain rural landscapes can be put into this category. But this, to me, is, is the postmodernist reality. Cultural landscapes, as Randy was saying, are the whole thing. And what I'm finding with our new students is that they insist that cultural resources and their conservation, natural resources and their conservation, and contemporary design and development have to come together, and to them, the cultural landscape framework is the way to do that. So it's not in opposition, it's central. If you look at the whole recommendation, it's trying to, I think, take the cultural landscape idea and apply it to the urban situation. It gets partway there. I think it's, um, you can look at some of these questions. This is some of the language which I'm not gonna go through because uh, Patricia is already showing you some of this, but it's, there is a language there that talks about experience, traditions and experiences, about cultural and economic processes, the shift towards that, certainly putting within the context of sustainable development, which is what cultural landscapes can do. And this definition that it is a historic layering. Layering is extremely important because the contemporary reality is a layer. The fact that the national, I think the National Register forms in U.S. asked for a period of significance. In cultural landscapes, the only period of significance is the present, but the layering, the richness of the history of connections to that place is critical to its understanding. Diversity and creativity being essential, that is central to the ecological concept. It's not central to the historic preservation concept. Many historic districts are in fact monocultures. That's why they were designated a whole area of late 19th century residential homes, for example. The idea of diversity and creativity being central is critical. I'm just gonna say, we've been applying a kind of a cultural landscape approach, and it works. It's a way of, you, you don't necessarily designate a place, that's not, you don't start with designation and then go to protection. Uh, this is actually the city in South India where I lived for many years. You do cognitive mapping because that's how you map the experience of a place, the rituals, and you understand that the way you represent place is often through things that come out of the artist or the poet's understanding. The Noli map of Rome is a mapping of a cultural landscape because the interior of the religious places is part of the public realm. That's an understanding probably from a cultural geographer, essentially. Uh, when we looked at the Byrd market, we said there are three realities that coexist here. You have to protect all three cultural landscapes, and all of them have different boundaries. Uh, our new project in Toronto, Kensington Market area, we were asked by Adam Vaughn, who is probably gonna be the next mayor of, Ottawa, of Toronto and is a politician, to use a cultural landscape approach to avoid what he sees as a complete 
war in Toronto between the historic preservationists on the one side and the development community on the other. So this is my final slide. It, I think we've moved beyond the Vienna Memorandum. We at least now have an intellectual framework for discussion. I think the whole recommendation is very important, but it's not, the language is not there yet. And the tools, I think, are still in their infancy. So thank you very much. <laughs>